since you guys probably all want to go to lunch on time, uh, I recommend that we start sometime soon. OK, so uh, welcome to the second uh, lecture in category theory. And let me just summarize what we talked about last time so we can all remember where we were. So at the beginning, we, met, uh, we, we learned what a category is. And then we met some simple categories, right? We created this little menagerie out of um, mathematical structures interpreted as categories. So we saw how sets, pre-ordered sets, and monoids could be interpreted as categories. And then we looked at categories of mathematical structures. So we looked at categories of those same things. And so we were able to see that those were indeed categories of categories. Right? And then we also looked at a little category uh, that had to do with type theory, where the objects were uh, types and, and, well, types, although eventually we'll extend that to typing contexts. And the morphisms were terms in context. And uh, then we asked, OK, well, since we can form categories of mathematical structures, and categories are themselves mathematical structures, can we define categories of categories? And this led us to the idea of what should be a morphism of categories. And then we discovered that this should be a functor, right? And then we saw that we had identity functors and composition of functors so that we could make categories of categories so long as we didn't do this uh, foundational taboo of trying to make a category of categories somehow a member of itself uh, and thereby avoiding paradox. OK, so today I want to carry on. And the first thing I want to talk about is how we can, uh, if we already have some categories, how we can make new categories out of them. So the first topic is uh, new categories from old. OK, and the first way we can do this that I want to talk about is indeed the most important arguably, at least. And that is the concept of an opposite category. So if we have a category C, we can form the category, which is called its opposite. Which I'll write like this with a superscript O. And this is called the opposite category of C. Okay, so in order for this to be a category, I have to tell you what its objects and arrows are, its identities, its composition, and then we have to check the composition laws, that is the unit laws and the associative law. So in this case, the objects, well, the object set or collection of the, oops, hang on, let me do it like this. The object collection of the opposite category of C is just the object collection of C. They have the same objects. For arrows, I can tell you what the homs are. So the arrows from A to B in C op are just the arrows from B to A in C. Okay? So the way I think of this is like those. Um, old neon signs, and there's like a switch uh, over on the side somewhere, and all the arrows are lit up, right? They're, they're neon tubes. And when you flip the opposite switch, it just takes an arrow with its head like this and turns off the head and illuminates the other head. And I will always use this red pen of duality uh, when I want to indicate the opposite of some construction, right? So you flip the switch, it switches the orientation of the arrow. Okay, so uh, that's that. So the identities well, the identity arrow on an object interpreted in C op is just the identity on that same object as an arrow in C. Right? And this makes sense because we have to switch the orientation of the arrows, but an identity arrow is an endomorphism. Remember this term from yesterday. 
And that means that the domain and codomain objects are the same. So when you swap them, they still remain the same. Right? So that's OK. And now we have composition. So if I want to compose an arrow f with an arrow g in C op, then what I do is I compose g with f in C. So let's see why this makes sense. Right? I'm saying that f and g are composable in C. So here is f and here is g. And because, oops, wait, that's not what I meant to write. Uh, G and F are composable in C, so here is G and here is F. Sorry, I'm uh, conditioned to write F before G for some reason. Uh, <laughs> and now we flip the switch, right? And what that does is it makes these arrows go the other way. But in order for them to have been composable in C, it meant the codomain of G was the domain of F. And then when we flip the switch, it says that the codomain of F is the domain of G, so they're still composable. Right? If they were composable before we flipped the switch, they're composable after. OK, and then I'll leave it to you to check that the unit laws and associative law still hold. OK, so that's a task for you. But now, uh, this construction of the opposite category is syntactically very simple, right? That's the intuition I want to give you. It's just flipping the switch. But it has some pretty deep consequences. Um, so first of all, this gives us the notion of dual constructions. Oh, and I guess before I say that, let me say one other thing. Uh, so flipping this switch and then flipping it again gets you back to where you started, right? If you look at each of these things, if you do it twice in a row, then you get the identity. So the fancy way of saying that is that this opposite construction is an involution. So in other words, C op op is just C for any category C. Okay? This is called an involution. And it gives rise to a, what we call a duality. Okay, so duality is just some, in this case, it just means some, some relationship arising from an involution. Okay? So in particular, for these dual constructions, it means whenever we have some construction in a category C, we can just view that same construction from the perspective of C op, and it will look like a different construction, namely the one in which all the arrows are pointing backwards. Right? But it's really the same thing. I just, I just flipped the switch. I didn't do anything original. Okay. And, um, it will turn out that uh, w whenever we have a construction which is interesting for some reason, typically its dual construction will also be interesting for potentially a different reason, but, but still interesting. Uh, and this gives rise to the idea of dual propositions. And in particular, theorems. Right? Because if you have any theorem that's true about something going on in the category C, if you flip the switch and think about that thing in the category C op, that there's going to be an analogous, that is a dual proposition, which is true in C op just because the original proposition was true in C. So this is a way of getting free theorems. And we're going to leverage this heavily uh, today and tomorrow. Okay? Does everyone understand this? It's very simple, but it's very important. So if there's anything confusing about it, ask now. If it seems simple to you, then it is, and you're, you're doing fine. Okay, so let's look about at how this opposite duality interacts with functors. Okay, so um, for any functor from a category C to a category D, we have, in fact, uniquely, uh, what's called an opposite functor, and it goes from the category C op to the category D op. 
Okay? So notice it does not go from the category D to the category C. It's not going in the other direction. It's going in the same direction, but between the opposites of the category on its categories on its boundary. Okay? What does this functor do? Well, actually, it just does the same thing as F. Like, really, F op is the same functor as F. It's just letting the uh, categories on its boundary pretend that their arrows are going the other way. Right? It's like, it's like these are two little kids, and they say, no, no, today we want to play opposite day. And F says, okay, fine, play opposite day. Just, you know, whatever this one wants, it says the opposite, and whatever this one says, this one understands the opposite, so this one still understands whatever that one said. Okay? So it's just like a little game. There's nothing deep going on here. Um, another way a functor can interact with an opposite category is uh, if we have a functor, F, I'm just reusing the letter in a different scope here, uh, whose domain category is the opposite of some category of interest, okay, then we say that the functor is contravariant. So again, there's nothing deep going on here. A contravariant functor is just a functor. It's just that the category at its domain is the opposite of some category of interest. Okay? Because every category has an opposite category. You can always just flip the switch. So whatever C op is, it has an opposite, which is C. And, and if you want to call the function as emanating from C rather than C op, then we just say that it's contravariant. But all that's going on is we're just saying add the opposite to the domain of the functor. Okay. So last time we learned about a very important kind of uh, functor, namely a representable functor. So recall that we had this idea of a functor C uh, uh, x arrow blank, and we called this kind of functor representable, and it was like a HOM set with a hole in it, right? Because if I put something here, then I get the HOM set, assuming that the category is locally small, but as I said, for this course, we'll just assume all our categories are locally small. So when we have a blank here, it means you can put something in the hole, and when you put an object in the hole, you get the collection of arrows back, and when you put an arrow in the hole, you post-compose with that arrow. So the obvious question is, what happens if we put the hole in the other place, right, in the other position? So we can define a functor, uh, I'll write it over here, C blank arrow X, right, and what does this do? Well, it goes from C up to set. And what does it do? Well, it takes an object and puts it in the hole. So it gives you back the HOM set from A to x. But now, if we give it an arrow, well, what should it do now? Well, OK, whatever it does, it should put the arrow in the hole. But what should this mean? Well, we can, like we did last time, we can figure it out by looking at the type, right? So this should go from the HOM set C from B to X. This should be a function with that domain, and with the codomain, uh, the HOM set C A to X. So it should take an arrow from B to X and give you back an arrow from A to X. But what you have as an argument is an arrow from A to B. So what do you do? Compose. You just compose, right? This should be F compose with blank which, as I said before, is just syntactic sugar for like lambda something, I've composed with that thing, right? So uh, this is just the dual of this, right? Here we post-compose something, an arrow that we put in the blank. Here we pre-compose with the arrow that we put in the blank. But if we think about this duality a bit, we should see that this is not surprising at all. Why? Because um, if you, if you, uh, Let's see, if you pre-compose in the opposite category, then you post-compose in the category itself. So this is just C op from x to blank, which was just, oops, uh, blank, which was just our ordinary conception of a representable functor. 
right? So this kind of contravariant representable functor is just a representable functor with the opposite category. And it has another name, which I won't use too much, but uh, Patty or no might, so I'll just mention that this is also called a representable representable pre-sheaf. Okay, so this idea of, of thinking about categories in terms of their representable functors is very deep because as long as you're considering lo locally small categories, basically it lets you trace out the structure of the category of interest in the category of sets and functions, right? So this is kind of like a, in, the, in the old days, there used to be these radio programs called the Farm Report, and they would call up like some farmer in Iowa and ask like, how's the corn crop in Iowa? And the guy would say, oh, you know, there's a drought this year and blah, blah, blah. And if they call enough farmers around the country, then they kind of get a sense of how the, the crops are, right? So with a representable functor, you ask each object, hey, how does the category look from your perspective? And you give it any other object, and it'll say, oh, I'll, here's what the set of morphisms from me to this other object look like, or here's what the set of morphisms to me from this other object look like. Right? And if you ask all the objects in the category how the category looks from its perspective, eventually you get a picture of what the category looks like altogether. So these representable functors give you a perspective of category theory that's ultimately equivalent to several others, uh, and it culminates in the celebrated Yoneda lemma. So if you've heard, of any, you've heard of any category theory, you've almost certainly heard of this, because whenever somebody says anything in category theory, there's always some smart aleck who goes, isn't that just a consequence of the Yoneda lemma? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is always yes, <laughs> okay? But it's not very illuminating until you go through this whole rigmarole of why, uh, why this, if you look at enough local um, uh, perspectives on the category, you can eventually build up a global perspective. Okay, so that's all I want to say about that. Uh, So now I want to tell you about a couple other constructions we can do to make new categories for old. So I shouldn't have erased that. I'm sorry. The next thing I want to tell you about is called the arrow category. Or a category of arrows that's interchangeable. And this says that for a category C, we have the category which I'll write like this, C with a superscript arrow on it. And it has objects, well, they're C arrows, by which I mean things like F from A to B in C, right? E.g., okay, I won't write E.g., I'll just, okay, that's an example. For arrows, Okay, well, if I have one C arrow object, F from A to B, and another C arrow object, which is a C arrow from C to D, call it G, then I want an arrow from this object to this object. So how can we build this out of the parts that we have in hand within the category C? Well, one obvious thing we can do is we can put an arrow here and put an arrow here and request that the, the square commutes. So it's pairs of arrows, i and j, between the domains of the respective C arrow objects, which are C arrows, and the codomain, such that you get a commuting square. So these are C commuting squares. OK? Question? What is C and D again? These things are objects in the category. These things are arrows in the category. But this arrow in the category C is now an object in the category of arrows of C. Okay? Then this pair of arrows in C, forming a commuting square, is an arrow in the category of arrows of C. 
Got it? OK. So then the identities, OK, well, uh, if I have some C arrow object, which is again a C arrow, uh, and I want to form the identity arrow on it, well, I know that the domain and codomain of the identity arrow are the same object. So in this case, it's, I need a square here, right, where these two sides are both the same arrow. OK, now we don't know anything about C, so I, we have to be parametric, sort of, in the way that Dan was talking about this morning. Can we think of arrows that we can put here and here, regardless of what the category C is, that will make a commuting square? Exactly, just the identities from the underlying category. OK? And now, uh, poor board management, sorry about that. I'll have to go over here for composition. Now, if I have two of these C arrow objects, or, uh, yeah, sorry, two C arrow arrows, which are composable, so I have this situation. I'm no longer going to bother to name the objects. I'm going to use this convention of putting dots for anonymous objects. OK? <coughs> now, I have here the I and the J such that this square commute. And I have an, oops, can't use H, a K and an L such that this square commutes. And again, parametrically, knowing nothing about this category, how can I get an arrow here and here that make the outer rectangle commute? I just compose in the underlying category, right? So I do I compose K and I do J compose L. OK? So. For any category, we can make this new arrow category by interpreting the arrows of the underlying category to be the objects of our arrow category and the, the squares to be the arrows. Okay? So this tells us something about the two-dimensional structure of the category C, namely which of its squares commute. So I'll give you as a task, there's some stuff about it in the notes, so you can read about it or try to think about it yourself. But you can iterate this construction, right? What if I form the arrow category of C arrows? Then what do I get? Or what if I form the arrow category of C arrow arrows? What do I get? OK? Question? This looks an awful lot like uh, There is a connection to natural transformations. So this is one way of building up the higher dimensional structure of categories. And when we get to natural transformations, we'll see that that's like the higher dimensional structure of categories of categories. OK? So yes, this is one way of, of building higher dimensional structure. And in particular, going back to something that I talked about yesterday, it's related to what I called, uh, uh, what did I call it? The interval category, the capital I, which was, remember, the walking arrow two points and an arrow between them. OK? Uh, so that's that. And there's one more such construction that I want to introduce you to, because I'm pretty sure it will come up when Patty and Noam lecture later. And it's actually what's called a subcategory of what I just described. So for reasons of time, I wasn't able to talk about subcategories during the lectures, but they're in the notes. So if you want to learn about that perspective, you can look at the notes. But here, we're just going to build them directly. Oh, sorry. There's one more thing I wanted to say about this. Forgive me. I forgot. So the arrow category gives us three important functors, which will come up later. Um, these are what are called the, the uh, what happened there? Uh, the domain the codomain, and the reflexivity functor. OK, so the domain and codomain functors go from an arrow category to its underlying category. And they take uh, uh, objects of the arrow category, which are arrows of the underlying category, respectively to their domain. And OK, let me do these at the same time. OK, 
uh, respectively to their domain and codomain, right? So it takes the arrow F to respectively the object A or the object B. And then they take arrows, which are these pairs, to respectively the first one or the second one. So just as, the, say, the domain functor takes F to A, it takes this square to the top arrow I, right? And then the codomain functor takes F to B and takes the square to J. Got it? Okay. And then the reflexivity. This is we're board management. I'll write it over here. The reflexivity functor goes the other way. It goes from a category to its arrow category. And it takes an object in the category to, well, it has to be an arrow, right? And we have to do this in a parametric way. So the only arrow that we know it for sure is associated with an object is, again, the identity arrow. Okay? And it takes um, an arrow to, well, uh, it's got to go from the image of an object, which we just said was an identity. So here we have two such. Now I want to build a commuting square using these two identity arrows and this arrow from A to B. Right? So what do I do? The only obvious thing, I put here F and I put here F. And by the unit law of composition, this square has to commute. Okay, so these are the ways to go back and forth between the category and its category of arrows. Or another way to say this is that there are ways to mediate between different dimensions of a higher dimensional category. Question? Um, are the domain and codomain functors well defined on things that were formed as an arrow category construction? Like, can I apply them to any arbitrary category? So you can always take the domain of an arrow in a category, right? But then, uh, well, in what way, what are the arrows on which you want to apply it if it's not an arrow category? Right, you have to, you have to pick those. I mean, if you can, if you can think of a, a way of sensibly defining objects and arrows on categories that aren't arrow categories, then you could presumably define these functors. But like, remember, a morphism has its domain and codomain objects as part, of its, its, um, as a part of its description. So this particular functor has this particular domain and codomain. You could maybe define some other functor that takes arrows to objects in a different way. OK. 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 So, so yes. Because an object in the arrow category is by definition an arrow in the original category, and that arrow in the original category has to have both a domain and a codomain. Okay, so you retain that information then? Yeah, because that's what it's defined to be. I mean, you get to know the information contained in the definition, otherwise you know, it would be not helpful to use the definition. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so sorry, I, I started to say and then I realized I skipped a step that uh, there's another construction closely related to this and that is called uh, the slice category. Okay, so uh, that is if we have um, an object in some category, we can define the category, and we use this notation, it's just traditional, I didn't pick it, but you call this, you read this as C sliced over A. Put this in scare quotes. Okay, and it has objects. So it's similar to the arrow category in that the objects are C arrows, but now they're C arrows whose codomain is A, right? 
So there are arrows in C whose codomain is fixed at A. So for arrows, if we have two such things, how can we make an arrow between these two arrows using things from the underlying category? Well, it's just an arrow between the domains. So it's commuting triangles, right? So this is basically this, where you cinch the bottoms to be a point. Or you can think of it as forcing the bottom arrow to always be the identity. OK. Um, so now what I want to point out is that whenever you have an arrow in the underlying category, it will give you a functor between the respective slice categories. So what I mean is, if I have here, <coughs> Okay, so here is uh, an arrow in the slice category over A. Now if I have an arrow in the underlying category from A to B, how can I transport this triangle, which I think of as sort of, you know, these things are like balloons filled with helium and they're like, there's a peg here holding them down, so they're stuck at A. And I want to take this sort of balloon configuration and move it over to B using F. Yeah, I just compose with F, right? So I can leave this part of the diagram alone. And for here, for the legs of the triangle, I just do X compose with F and Y compose with F. So whenever I have an arrow in the underlying category, I get a functor from the slice category over A to the slice category over B. And what it does is it just composes in the, for the objects and it leaves the arrows alone. Okay? So let's see, how am I doing? Ooh, okay, gotta speed up. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so. The next topic I want to talk about is one of the things that I started to uh, discuss very broadly at the very beginning yesterday, which was this idea that when we generalize from thinking about things in terms of sets to thinking about things in terms of categories, we can no longer reason structurally about the objects because we don't know that they're sets. We don't know what's inside of them. So we can only reason what I call behaviorally using the maps between the objects. So this is what I call behavioral reasoning. OK. So let's go through a little uh, mental exercise here. So, in, so uh, let's, talk, let's think about what is equality in sets? Well, two sets are equal just in case for any element it's in the first one if and only if it's in the second one. Right? Uh, okay. That's what it means for two sets to be equal. This is extensional. OK, but usually equality of sets is not a very interesting concept because when we want to compare two sets, usually we don't care if they're exactly equal, right? We want a more liberal definition of what it means for sets to be essentially the same, some kind of equivalence that doesn't care exactly what the elements are, but somehow some other um, relationship between them. OK, so what that typically is is uh, the notion of equivalence in sets. And that is the notion of bijection. OK? So probably somewhere you've learned that um, what a bijection is, right? So uh, we say that two sets x and y are bijective 
if there is some function, which I'll call p, from one to the other, uh, which is two things. Do you remember what these two things are? Exactly. They're injective. It's injective. And it's surjective. OK? So a function, a function is injective if it doesn't collapse any points of its domain. right? So in particular, that means if I have two points of the domain, then if I apply the function to them, and the results are the same, then it must be the case that they were already the same to begin with. Right? That's the notion of not collapsing any points. OK, so what I want to do now is go through uh, some kind of like, oh, well, yeah, let me go here and see if we can recharacterize this notion in a way that doesn't refer to the points, right? Because this is a structural definition. It's, talk, it's quantifying over points in the domain. And in category theory, we don't assume that the objects are set, so we can't talk about points in them because they may not have points. OK, so, so how can we characterize this behaviorally? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this and say that if the function p is injective, so p injective implies that for, I'm going to take the two points and replace them with two function images. So I'm going to say for any functions f and g from w to x, I'm going to leave that part parametric, so I'll write down here. Um, for all points in the new domain, if P after F of W equals P after G of W, then uh, uh, F of w equals g of w. Okay, so all I've done is I've taken this <laughs> x0 and x1 and considered them to be images under f and g respectively of some single point w coming from another set. Okay, it looks like I'm making things more complicated, but there's a method to my madness, so hang on for just a second. Okay, so here we have a universal quantification and an implication. So we're saying that this implication holds point-wise, basically, for every w. Now, if an implication holds point-wise, then it holds set-wise. Okay, you can check that, but it's true. So this implies that for all w in w, if p after f of w equals uh, p after g of w, I'm going to put brackets here, then for all w in w, oops, put the bracket in the wrong place, uh, f of w equals g of w. Okay? So, this might look even more complicated, but why have I done this? Why does this help me? Well, let's look over here. We're saying for every element in W, the F and G images of that point agree. In the category of sets, what does that say about the functions F and G? They're equal functions, right? That's how functions are, that's how equality of functions is defined in the category of sets, that they ha take the same value on every argument. So this is saying, that f equals g. Likewise, what is this saying? Exactly, saying p after f equals p after g. Okay, and now the method of my madness is hopefully showing. I've got a characterization here with no more points. I'm just talking about the sets and the functions. 
And this is good because this characterization now we can translate to any category. We replace sets and functions with objects and arrows. Okay? So that leads us to our next definition. which is that of a monomorphism. Oh, uh, okay. I'll leave it as an exercise because I'm running low on time, but it's easy to check that this implication goes the other way too. So if you have this property, then you can prove that the function P is injective. I'll, I'll leave that for the exercise session. Okay, so da da da, where was I? Wait. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, monomorphism is, a, is an arrow which is post cancelable. What does this mean? It means exactly what we worked out over there. If we have for any f and g uh, arrows in the category, if f followed by, say, uh, mono, uh, monomorphism p, give it a name, if f followed by p equals g followed by p, then uh, uh, f equals g. Right? So the point is we can cancel the p if it comes after arbitrary arrows. Okay, and notationally this is written like this. It's like an arrow with a tail. Okay. Any questions? Sorry? Yes, I will. Okay, so what this means is, right, if I have any F and any G, well, okay, first of all, let's see that actually, and I'm following them by P, right? So implicit in this statement is the fact that F and G have to be parallel. Why is that? Well, in order to satisfy the, the hypothesis of the implication, the antecedent, I guess that's called, right? Uh, then in order for F and G to be composable with P, their mutual, their codomain has to be the domain of P, so their codomains have to be the same, right? So that means that f and g have to f and g have to end at the same place in order for this to make sense. And furthermore, in order for this equality to hold, equality can only hold between parallel arrows. So that means f and g have to start at the same place too. So if you elaborate this mentally, you'll you'll see that it's a it's a precondition that f and g have to be parallel. But this is saying that if you have any f and g that when you compose them with p, you get the same thing. Then you can just Forget about the P and, and observe that F and G must have been the same to start with. Okay, so that is the notion of a monomorphism. And now let's take our red pen of duality to this thing and turn the arrows around. Okay, so what should the dual definition be? Well, it's called an epimorphism, and it is what kind of arrow? It's a something cancelable arrow. Exactly. It's a pre-cancelable arrow, and okay, so I'll just write over here for any f and g, right? If F composed with P is G composed with P. Well, now I want to do the composition in the reverse order, so I can just do that. Right? I replace the forward composition with the reverse composition. So that's, well, okay. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm just reusing the board. Uh, then the arrows were the same to begin with, F and G. Okay, so uh, a surjective function is 
a function that doesn't miss any points of its codomain, right? So it says that for all y uh, in y, there exists some x in x such that p of x equals y. And it turns out that in the category of sets, the injective functions are exactly the monomorphisms, and the surjective functions are exactly the epimorphisms. Um, but that's not true in all categories. I'm going to come back to that point in a moment. Uh, yeah, let me use what board? This board. So now let's prove some theorems about monomorphisms. And then by duality, we'll automatically have theorems about epimorphisms. OK, so these are actually very simple, but they just illustrate the style of reasoning. So here are three facts about monomorphisms. First, identity morphisms. Harmonic. Monic, sorry, monic is just the adjective for monomorphism. Uh, second, compositions of monics are monic. Third, if I have a composition that's monic, if M followed by M is monic, then the first one was already monic. OK, so let's go through these. Uh, proof. One. OK, so we want to show that identity morphisms are monic, which by definition means that we want to show that they're post cancelable. Right? So what we need to do is we set up an arbitrary pair of, of parallel morphisms that compose with the identity to equal things. This is what we assume. What we want to show somehow is, uh, word management, is that F is equal to G. How do we do this? Exactly. This is true by the composition unit law. Done. OK? How about the second one? Well, the assumption is that F followed by M followed by N is G followed by M followed by N, and that M and N are monics. And the goal is that F equals G. So how do we get from here to there? Well, we know that N is monic. So we can cancel that. But then we also know that M is monic. So we can cancel that. And we're done. OK. How about the third one? So remember, the goal is to show that M is monic. So we start with. F followed by M is G followed by M. And our goal is to prove that F is equal to G. OK. Now this time we can't cancel the M because we don't know that M is monic. That's what we're trying to prove, right? So we have to try something else. So if you remember back from yesterday, we saw that there was this uh, thing we could do with diagrams that showed that uh, equality of arrows was a congruence with respect to composition. Remember that? That was called whiskering. So if we whisker this by n, then from this equation, we can infer that f followed by m followed by n is g followed by m followed by n. Do you see that step? All we did was took two equal things and composed an arrow to them, and therefore they remain equal. OK, but now we're home free, right, because the assumption was that the composition of M and N is monic, 
thus post cancelable, so we cancel it and get the equation that we want. Okay? So do you see how like the style of reasoning we have to use now is probably quite different than what we were used to before because we can't refer to, you know, for any element in the domain of something like you there's no element, so you can't reason that way. You have to reason just the objects and the arrows. Okay, so for the exercise session, I'll leave it to you to state and prove the dual uh, uh, theorems about uh, epimorphisms. Sorry? What is the epic? Oh, epic. <laughs> okay, which actually leads me into my next point, which is I want to point out something uh, which I call mnemonic and epic fail. <laughs> And the problem is this. So although in the category of sets, monomorphisms correspond to injective fu functions and epimorphisms correspond to surjective functions, in other categories, epimorphisms are not surjective when considered as functions. So let me give you an example. In the category of monoids, you can take uh, the inclusion map. So this. In monoids, you can take the inclusion of the natural numbers with addition and its unit, which is zero. And the inclusion just means think of everything as itself, but now just reinterpreted in the integers under addition with its unit, zero. Okay? So it just means take zero to take the natural number zero to the integer zero. Take the natural number seven to the integer seven. Take plus to plus, take zero to zero. Okay? So this map is monic, it's, which is pretty easy to see, but you can think about this later if you want. But it's also epic, which is a bit harder to prove. Um, if you want, you can talk to me about this later and I'll give you a pointer to it. But it turns out that it's epic. Basically, where the generators go determine where everything else goes. Something like that is what's going on. Um, but clearly, it's not surjective <laughs> on the underlying function. So if you consider it as a function from the natural numbers to the integers, it's missing all the negatives, right? So it's not surjective as a function. Okay, so, um, so the point, or maybe another way to say this, or, well, this is not equivalent, so, uh, um, so this, uh, this, this comes from the fact that functors don't necessarily have to preserve monics and epics. Okay, so we're gonna need some kind of better characterization of uh, equivalence in an arbitrary category. We can't just use monic and epic like we could in sets. That's the point I wanna make. Okay, so the thing that comes to our rescue oh, I should do this. The thing that comes to our rescue is a strongly related concept. Um, which is the definition of a split monic which is a post invertible arrow okay so now we've got a couple, uh, and then of course, by duality, we're gonna have split epics, but let me pause for a moment here and say, now we've got 
like four concepts running around, monic epic, split monic, split epic, and pre-cancelable, pre-invertible, post-cancelable, post-invertible. If you haven't seen this before, it's very natural for you to confuse which of these words means which of these things, right? So I'm gonna try to give you a mnemonic that works for me. Take it for whatever you think it's worth. But the first vowel in the word monic is an O, and the first vowel in the word post is an O, okay? So a monic is post something. So a monic is post cancelable. A split monic is post invertible. An epic starts with an E, and E is the first vowel in pre. So the pattern continues to hold here that a epimorphism is pre cancelable and a split epimorphism is pre invertible. So I don't know if that helps you, but it's gotten me through a lot of uh, things. So <laughs> whatever. Okay. So this is. I E. The first vowel in split is I. <laughs> yeah, but I'm talking about the monic or epic part. So forgetting the invertible versus invertible part. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, sometimes, I mean, you know, sometimes words are chosen and like if you don't have any context for the word right you just have to remember because there's always that's the that's the blessing and the curse of category theory there's always the dual construction of anything right so if someone tells you what a blah 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 is then you don't know if blah 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 is like something or it's you know it's a dual construction it could be either one and if you don't have some reason to to know that it's one versus the other then you just have to come up with a mnemonic and this is mine make your own if you like um, so it's an S arrow, an arrow, sorry, an arrow S in the category, such that there is an arrow R in the category, such that S followed by R is the identity. Right? That's what it means to be post invertible. It means S is post invertible if there's something that I can do after it that gets me back to where I started. Right? And so, uh, okay, I won't write it down. Well, I'll use actually this, right? A split epic is a pre-invertible arrow. So in that case, it's the R such that there's an S such that the composition is the identity. Okay? So, let's see, how does this help us? Uh, oh, so two things. First of all, this split implies non-split. So split monics are monic. Right? If this weren't true, it would be really perverse to name these things this way, but luckily it is. Okay, so this is easy to prove. Uh, let S followed by R be the identity on whatever the domain of S is. Right? And now we want to show from the assumption that F followed by S equals G followed by S, that F equals G. Okay, so what do we do? Well, again, we whisker by R to get F followed by S followed by R equals G followed by S followed by R. And now, we use the definition to see that, uh, that um, F followed by the identity is G followed by the identity. And then we use the unit law to see that F is G. Okay? So split monics are monic. And crucially, functors preserve them. Okay, so again, uh, we assume that S uh, followed by R is an identity. Okay, and now we want to show that F of S followed by something is the identity. What's the obvious choice to try here? 
f of r, right? So let's see if we can make this work out. Well, we know that functors preserve compositions, right? So this is f of s followed by r, because functors preserve compositions. We know that s followed by r is the identity, so this is f of the identity. And we know that functors preserve identities, so we get this step. Does that make sense? You catch all the steps? OK, good. So, so to summarize, right, split monics are monics. Functors preserve split monics. By duality, split epics are epics. And functors preserve split epics. So you get the duals for free. Isn't that nice? Yes, sorry. It's the identity morphism on whatever object. So I, yeah, so this is a notational <laughs> shorthand that's used a lot, right? So this is, uh, okay, so this is the identity on the common domain of S and codomain of R, right? Because S composed with R is the identity on what, wherever S started and R ended, it's the same point. Right? So it means S goes somewhere, R goes back. And when you make this round trip, then it's the same thing as doing nothing. Okay, so this is the identity here. This is the identity of f of here, right? Yeah. Okay, so you, yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe it would have been better for me to use more elaborate notation, but as you go, this is the kind of notation people use because you can always mentally fill in the blanks. So it's like, you know, when you do type theory, a lot of times you can, you can put some blanks some places and have the, Compiler elaborate them for you. It's like that. I'm making you be my compiler. Okay, so let's see. How am I doing? Okay, good. So the next thing I want to tell you about is this piece of fan fiction I've been working on. No, no, no. Okay, so I want to tell you a little story that I call Harry Potter and the Axiom of Choice. <laughs> <laughs> what? I worked hard on this. Okay, so if you don't know, Harry Potter was a boy wizard who was the only person who could save the world from the evil Lord Voldemort. And the axiom of choice is a uh, theorem of <laughs> set theory, which says that um, for a family of non-empty sets, there's a function, oops, there's a function uh, choosing an element of each. Okay? So this is one of many equivalent ways to state this theorem or this property. Uh, okay, so the first thing I want to tell you about is that, well, okay, let's talk about what a family of sets is. Okay, so a family of sets uh, E sub B, where B is in B, say, is a collection of sets like this indexed by another set. Okay, so it's a set index collection of sets. Okay, so what I want to show you now is that a family of sets is really just the same thing as an ordinary function. Okay, so let me explain that. So suppose we have a set E and a set B and a function F between them. So now suppose that E is the collection of students at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. So we have Harry, Hermione, uh, who else is in there? There's like Cedric and Ron and <laughs> the evil ones, Malfoy. Okay, and then B is the collection of houses of the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. So here we have Gryffindor, uh, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. 
right? And now the function f in the Harry Potter story is this magical hat that you put on your head and it tells you which house you're supposed to live in, okay? Uh, there are some French people here, right? Anyone French? Do you remember what the sorting hat is called in the French Harry Potter? No, I don't know. It's called the, it, it's called the chapeau, which I think is genius. <laughs> okay, so um, the sorting hat is a function which sends students to houses, okay? So it says, Hermione, you go to Gryffindor. Harry, you go to Gryffindor. Whoever you are, you go here. Uh, the evil kids all end up here for some reason. And, I don't know, Ravenclaw might have been empty, I can't remember. Um, okay, so that's what the sorting hat does. Okay, now I want to show you why this function is like a family of sets. So in my fan fiction version, instead of a hat that you put on your head and it tells you which house to go to, there's a giant hat that you put on the roof of the house and then it tells the house which students are to live there, right? So we can think of this as a function from B to the, well, we can think of this as the disjoint union, however you want to express this, of the students. Um, well, okay, let me just first, as a first cut, I'll just put set up here, right? So the point is that my, my reimagined sorting hat sends houses to sets of students rather than students to houses. How does it work? Well, when you put it on the roof of Gryffindor, it says, hey, these are your students, exactly the ones that I sent to you. Okay? When you put it on the roof of Hufflepuff, it says, this is your set of students. And when you put it on the roof of Ravenclaw, it says, sorry, no students for you. And when you put it on the roof of Slytherin, it says, you get all the evil kids. Okay, so if you think about it a bit, you'll see that these two ways of describing this sorting are equivalent. You can either tell the students which houses to go to, or you can tell the house which sets of students they get. Both of these things sort the students into the houses. Okay? So why did I tell you all of this? Uh, let me go over here. Actually, I should go over here. Okay, so, um, so, uh, if, oh, so each of these sets are like, this is like the E sub G of this index family of sets. This is like the E sub H. This is the E sub uh, S, and this was the E sub R, right? These are the families. So. If we require that a family of sets be non-empty, right, well, okay, then Ravenclaw must have had a student. I think uh, Cho Chang was in Ravenclaw. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, then, okay, if, if every family is non-empty, right, then it means that this, this sorting function is surjective, right? It hits every house. Some student gets sent to, to each house, okay? So, uh, da da uh, okay, so I'll write over here. Um, if for all B in B, uh, E sub B not empty, then this just means that the sorting function F is surjective. But in sets, that's the same thing as saying that it's epic. Right? Okay, that's the, that's the premise here. There's a function choosing an element of each set, right? So this is like choosing a prefect for each house. For every house, you have to pick a student. And furthermore, the student that you picked for that house has to live in that house. It, it's not fair if the prefect of Gryffindor lives in Hufflepuff, okay? So what this means is that picking an element of each E B means finding a function S from B to E such that when you compose it 
with f, you get the identity. Right? So in other words, it's saying that I have a function going the other way here, which I call s. So for each house, I pick a prefect, and then I have to check that the prefect lives in that house. So when I check the house that the pre prefect lives in, it's the same house that I started with. Right? That's this condition. OK, but what is this? This just says that f is split epic. Right? It has a pre-inverse, s. OK, so now we've recharacterized the axiom of choice using only behavioral uh, uh, stuff. Right? So ac is true just in case every epic splits. And this characterization is something now we can ask about any category, not only the category of sets. We can ask in the category of monoids, is it true that every epic is split? And it turns out that it's not true. I guess it's a race now. Uh, oh, yeah, because it was here. Uh, for that example that I gave before with the natural numbers into the integers, right? Any, any monoid morphism that you want to define going the other way has to send the negative integers somewhere, right? But then when you compose it back with the function that we had, the, the embedding, it's going to skip all the negative integers. So it's not going to be the case that the composition is the identity. Therefore, it's not pre-invertible. So this characterization of the axiom of choice happens to fail in the category of monoids. Okay? But you can ask the question in any category. Does it make sense? OK. So I hope you like my little story. The last topic I want to talk about is how we can use this idea of split monic and split epic morphisms to give us a characterization of being equivalent in an arbitrary category. So this will be like uh, generalizing the bijection of sets to work in any category. OK, so um, let me switch pens. So I'm just going to introduce another piece of terminology that's going to be equivalent to split monic and split epic. We say if S followed by R is the identity on whatever it must be, then S is a section, this is vocabulary, to R, and R is a retraction to S. Yeah. OK, so this terminology should at least be familiar, right? So like if a politician says something really stupid, like we should deport people based on their demographic characteristics, <laughs> then what he should really do is take it back <laughs> so that you end up in the same state of thinking he's a general idiot, but maybe not a total idiot that you started instead of some <laughs> different state. OK? This terminology is maybe slightly less familiar, but at least if you remember one of the two, you can work out which is which. OK, so in other words, being a split monic. means having a retraction. And dually, being split epic means having a section. OK. Now, an interesting theorem about sections and retractions. So, uh, how do I want to say this? Oh, right. So if an arrow has both a section and a retraction, then those two arrows are the same. OK? So in other words, for an arrow f, 
if there is an S such that S followed by F is the identity, and there's an arrow R such that F followed by R is the identity, then S equals R. Okay, the proof is just a picture. Let's just draw what we have. Here's F, here's S, here's R. By assumption, S followed by F is the identity. And by assumption, F followed by R is the identity. Now, what is S followed by the identity? That's just S. And what is the identity followed by R? That's just R. So now paste this diagram together, and you get S equals something equals something equals something equals R, right? And by the transitivity of equality, witnessed by diagram pasting from yesterday, we conclude that S has to be the same as R. Okay, so I call this um, the football theorem. <laughs> so um, now, let's see, this, So if F from A to B has section and retraction G, then this happens if and only if G from B to A, going the other way, has retraction and section F, right? Do you see that? Because if, if uh, G is a section for F, then F is a retraction for G, and likewise, right? And we know that if F has a section and a retraction, then they're the same. So if it has a section and a retraction, then they're the same thing, right? And then furthermore, the retraction and the section of that thing are back to F again. Okay, so this gives us the definition of an, of an isomorphism. In any category, an arrow F is an, an isomorphism or an iso if there exists a G going the other way. which is both a section and retraction for it. So in other words, so if you compose them in either order, you get the respective identities. Okay? So this is my proposed notion of equivalence in an arbitrary category because the definition refers only to the objects and to the arrows, and to composition and to identity, which are all things that we know have to exist in any category. Okay, so uh, let me just point out that um, we write G, or I guess F, I guess I should say. We write F inverse, like this, for G, and we know that this is sound in the sense that if there are two things that have this property that could be inverses for F, right? If F has two inverses, then it has two sections and retractions, right? Two things that act as both a section and retraction. So in particular, the first one acts as a section and the second one acts as a retraction. And by the football theorem, they must have been the same all along. Okay, so we can unambiguously write uh, this. Okay, 
So, da -da -da, okay. And, and we write, uh, well, okay. I think I'll stop there since we're out of time. So, does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you.